Good morning, Forefront. Good morning. Good morning, virtual folks. I'm sorry that our virtual live stream isn't working like normal, and you get my phone. Uh, and my phone also usually has my timer on it, so that I know how long I'm preaching. It is 11.44. Someone do math for me. What is 25 minutes from now? 12.10. 12.10. Is that right? 12.09. Very specific. I love that about you. Great. There's my goal time. So I'll keep my eye on that clock in the back. Hi, live stream. We're also recording this on high quality cameras in the back. And we'll repost this service with high quality video and audio later. So, but for now, you're really close to me this week. Um, we're so glad that you all are here this morning. Um, I have a quick question for you, though. How many of you think anger is a good emotion? Raise your hand. If you think anger is a good emotion, good. You probably read my newsletter article then. And then, how many of you think anger is bad or a sinful emotion? Raise your hand. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Well, I don't know about you, but uh, I've, had a, I've had a complex relationship with anger over the years. And um, it really has come out a lot just in the last few months that I've been sort of negotiating um, my relationship to anger. Austin and I went on our honeymoon to Italy for two weeks. And about halfway through our honeymoon, we decided to take a little break from all the travels that we were doing and go to a small town called Rapallo, Italy, which is kind of etched out in the side of a, of a hill, that overlooked beautiful ocean, water. It was just amazing. It's a spa resort. And on the train ride there, after having been, of course, together nonstop for a whole week at this point, uh, we start having kind of what is a, a heated discussion on the train. You know, we have to keep your voices when you're on the train, you're not in New York City. And so, Big emotions. We both express big emotions back to one another, but with like trying to be very tampered in our emotions and the volume of our voices and all of these things. After like an hour of going back and forth with a very kind of heated discussion, I couldn't even tell you what it was about now. We just decided like, let's just stop talking about this. This is an exhausting, exasperating, like we're on our honeymoon. Let's just pretend like that conversation didn't happen. Like, let's be happy. We're headed to this really beautiful spa resort. Like, let's not ruin it with this discussion that we're having with big emotions. And so we just sort of tried to push it down and push it aside and just forget about it and continue on with our blissful honeymoon. We arrived in Rapallo, Italy. It was late at night, and we were like, oh, this is a really small town. There's like no ride shares here. And we're like, where are the buses? And there are no taxis. And we're like, how are we going to get from here to the resort? And so with our luggage, after a long day of travel, we like just sort of like pull up Google and we're like, okay, apparently there's a bus like several blocks from here that may or may not be coming at some point tonight. Let's, let's walk over there. So here we are, we're schlepping through the streets, we're frustrated, we're annoyed, we're kind of being quiet and silent with one another. And, and we get to the bus stop and we're waiting there and the bus isn't coming, the bus isn't coming, and we're both frustrated, we just want to be to the resort. And then a bus pulls up. And I'm like, hey, let's just let's get on it. This is it. This is going to be it. I'm like trying to talk with the with, with a, with a driver. And I kind of feel like the driver kind of knows what I'm saying because he's repeating the same words back to me. So I'm like, I feel like I feel like this could be it. He knows what I'm saying. And Austin's like, this isn't it. This is the wrong direction. Don't get on that bus. And I'm like, come on, come on, come on. Let's get on the bus. Let's get on the bus. And so he, being my husband, he's just very agreeable. <sighs> grabs the bag and he gets on the bus and we're staying there and I can tell he's just so frustrated, so annoyed with me in this moment. And he's on his phone and he's, he's taking deep breaths in and out, in and out, and I'm like, we're on the bus, it's going to be okay. And he's like, look, this is not going in the right direction. It's the opposite way of the hotel. I told you this is not the right bus. I'm like, fine, we'll get off of the bus the next stop. And so we get off of the bus on the next stop and, and we're standing in the street and we're trying to figure out what to do next and all of a sudden I find myself yelling at Austin at the top of my lungs in this random city in the streets in Rapallo, Italy. And I immediately, as soon as I've been yelling at him at the top of my lungs, and him being his sweet self, just standing and looking at me. <laughs> I'm like, who am I? Who am I that I just yelled at you in the streets in this random city? Like, I've never yelled at anyone like that out in public in my entire life. Like, like what is happening for me? Who am I and why did I just do that? Well, I would argue that I just did that because we had a really intense discussion that we had no resolution to on the train. And I decided to bury it down and decided it was not buried, it was not done with us yet, and it was going to come up in some other random way that was disconnected that I was going to be overly frustrated. Growing up in evangelicalism, um, I was taught that anger was a sin. If you had anger, it meant you had unforgiveness and you had bitterness. And so my relationship with anger was really complicated. 
Um, I can remember, if I think back of my therapist to the moments when I've been angry the most, it's often with my father, as we've navigated um, his substance abuse, and my disappointment about the ways he isn't able to show up for me because of that, and our struggles and boundaries and connection and relationship. And I can remember my grandmother, any time I expressed any frustration, this was, I was uh, 19 here, uh, like my little like my little Narnia goat thing going on. Uh, and so my grandma would say to me, Josh, you know, you can't be angry with your dad. You got to forgive him. You can't hold on to that. I, I wasn't even allowed 30 seconds of anger. It was immediately, you got to forgive. You got to let go of it. You can't let that eat you up. And so I never learned how to sit with anger or to be okay with anger. Instead, anger was a, was a huge enemy and it was a sign that God was not at work in my life, that I wasn't righteous. But this, then, then contrast that with, I had a stepfather who was incredibly verbally abusive as a child. Um, never touched me once, but used anger as a tool to control and instill fear and submission to me. And so growing up, I had quickly decided that I was never going to be an angry person. I was never going to let anger be a thing for me. Because it seemed like it was just every turn, it just seemed like it was a negative thing. Um, and so instead, I would reallocate what I was feeling to a new emotion. So I, if I was angry, I would say, I'm so frustrated. I'm so annoyed. Biggest one is I would say I'm so sad. I wasn't sad. I was angry. But sadness was a little bit acceptable. You could, you could grieve a little bit. Then you've got to move on. You've got to trust Jesus. And so I didn't allow myself to experience anger until my husband, the doors opened wide up. <laughs> And I'm like, who is this person? All of these years, I've never experienced anger, and now I'm experiencing anger for the first time. And I remember, I remember the first time I yelled at you in an argument. I remember just being like, oh my god, I'm so sorry. Like, why did I do that? You know? And and I just remember the the the, the visceral disconnect in my body of like, why am I why am I feeling angry with this person? Maybe this person isn't meant for me. Because if I'm experiencing anger with them, and I've never experienced that with anyone else, then then maybe this is a bad sign. But our marriage counseling therapist, um, Heather, in this picture that we took at our wedding, she's a, a smart, wise, intelligent woman. As we went through premarital counseling, she said this, perhaps you can experience anger with Austin because he's the first person you felt safe enough to express your anger with. Aha, there it was. That made so much more sense. And it made sense because Austin is the first person I've ever met. If you can't tell, this is my husband that I'm just doing it. Austin is the first person that I've ever met that had a healthy relationship with anger. He was the first person I've ever met that could interact with, with anger in a way that felt both cathartic and healthy. He was the first person that I interacted with that could, expect, could experience anger but not say really hurtful and harmful things in the midst of it, but didn't use it as a form of fear and manipulation. As somebody who just would just very easily just name, I'm feeling angry today. Or I'm really angry with what you just did. Or he would go really quiet and I'd be like, what's going on? You know, your face is a little red. He's like, I'm angry. <laughs> right? And, and the fact that he would name anger and he would just be okay with it made me really uncomfortable because that's not how I grew up. But I began to realize that because he was comfortable with anger, I could be comfortable with anger and it didn't make him afraid. And it didn't push him away. And it didn't cause him to amp up even more. And all of a sudden I began to realize that maybe anger... Maybe anger could be good. Maybe anger didn't have to be a bad thing and it was only used in hurtful or abusive ways. So I want us to take a moment today and maybe deconstruct some of the things maybe we've been taught societally or theologically in our church traditions about anger. Uh, there's a lot of different passages that speak about anger. If you ask ChatGPT or Google to, to give you a bunch of verses, there will be an exhaustive list of passages about anger. And so we know there's a variety of opinions throughout Scripture that we can read about what people think about anger at different times and situations and circumstances. And quite frankly, they don't all agree with us, with each other which actually is very consistent in Scripture. There's a lot of competing voices and opinions. That's the beauty of Scripture. It's the beauty of our Christian tradition is that they're all in conversation and they're all in progressing in their faith and understanding and belief over time. Anyone who's ever taught you that there is one opinion or thought on everything throughout Scripture that you can figure it all out systematically is lying to you and ignoring something or washing something away that's not actually supposed to be there. So let's look at some of the different varying opinions and just see if there's, if there's different bits of wisdom that we can gain from some of these passages. First one is Psalm 37, 8. 
remember the book of Psalms, book of Proverbs, Ephesians, these are all books of wisdom. These are not books of promise. I often, I'll, I'll preach about this next week when I talk about, um, I'm not going to tell you what I'm talking about because I don't, don't want to tell you too soon. Um, <laughs> keep you on bated breath. But one of the passages says that, you know, if you raise a child in the wood, they should go. When they get old, they will not depart from it. And my grandmother would hold on to that as if it was a promise that all of her kids were going to remain Christians. And my like, grandma, that's not a promise. That is just simple, like, wisdom of the time. That, like, generally, if you do this, or often if you do this, this may happen for your child. And so hear these words about anger in Psalm in a similar thing. This is not a, a, a general rule or principle for all things. Don't give in to worry or anger. It only leads to trouble. I don't know about you, but no matter how hard I tell myself not to worry, <laughs> worry happens. No matter how much I tell myself that anger, uh, have anger, anger happens. So uh, this passage, I don't know how much of it's saying to, to, to not feel these emotions, because we do feel these emotions. But instead, I think it's, a, it's asking us, what do we do with those emotions? How are we responding to those emotions? How are we interacting with them? In Ephesians 4, 26 through 27, it says, In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. I think this is a really interesting passage. Because it's interesting It's interesting wisdom in that it's saying you can be angry. Just don't sin in your anger. It's okay to be angry. It's going to happen. But when you do it, be mindful of how you're interacting with it. Are you using it in harmful and abusive ways? Are you causing it, using it as a tool of fear and manipulation? Are you using it, are you allowing it to fester to the point that it becomes bitterness, and then it becomes rage, and then it becomes malice, and then it becomes violence, and then it becomes maybe even murder? Are you letting that fester? Are you letting that go a little bit deeper than it needs to before you actually release it and let it go? Don't move too fast up from it, but how long do you hold on to it? And as I've said in sermons before, I think that's one of the things Austin's taught me the most, is I'm quick to move past difficult emotions, and Austin likes to sit in them for days <laughs> and just feel them. And I'm like, babe, we got to move on. we got to move forward. we got to get over this. And we call each other in the middle. He's like, nope, we're going to sit in this for a little bit. And I'm like, nope, we're going to move on. And we find ourselves in the middle. And I think that is what we're, we need to learn how to have a healthy relationship with a wide array of emotions, particularly anger as well. Um, I once heard a mentor say that he and his wife never went to bed angry. And so this, this passage, you know, talks about not letting the, 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 the sun set, going to bed with, with anger still in your heart. Um, I think it's interesting to think about that, that that might be a good principle to live by, that sometimes, like, if you can talk it out, you can resolve it before you go to bed, don't hold on to it. But here's the thing. Sometimes a good night's rest and cooler heads prevail. Sometimes you, if you just... Poor Austin. Sometimes it's like 10 o'clock at night, and I'm like opening a can of worms, and he's like, I was asleep 30 minutes ago. And, and I want to like really get into this thing. He's like, I'm not going to be able to talk about this with you right now in a level-headed way. And so I have to learn to just breathe, go to bed. We'll talk about this, and we're going to have a much better productive conversation tomorrow morning. Right? Sometimes you just have to let that have the space it needs. I have another friend that said, um, you know, when they get really angry, they have to be really careful because they do say things that hurt people. So when they get angry, just stuff just pours out that maybe has been held down. And my advice to that is, is I, I can understand why that's the case. My advice to that would be maybe, maybe practice letting those things out sooner so that when you're, when you're angry, it doesn't tap that because you're suppressing something and anger is letting, letting it out. And so maybe be quicker to talk about things so that when you get angry, there's not like a box of secrets from 1946 that just come <laughs> bursting forth. You're like, you've been holding on to that that long. Wow, okay. So just, you know, maybe think about that a little bit. But here's another thing. I, I don't want anyone to hear me say that it's okay to let your emotions go unbridled in your anger because I do think James in chapter 1, verse 19, gives us some really beautiful wisdom. He says, everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. I agree with the first part. I don't agree with the second part of James. That's okay to disagree here. And I'm going to tell you why I disagree with James, because he's basically saying that anger does not produce righteousness or goodness, and that he's basically demonizing anger in this moment. I don't know what his relationship was with his mother or father, but something <laughs> may be getting projected here. But I do think that the first part of this passage is beautiful. Because it is an invitation that when we're angry, let's step back for a moment. Let me be slow to speak. Let me be quick to listen to what this person is saying to me. Let me be slow to anger. Because maybe the thing that they're saying is triggering something in me that actually has nothing to do with the thing. 
I don't know what it may be, but like maybe I feel like this is something that Austin does really well when he's angry. He, he takes an inventory before he unleashes. Because when he unleashes his anger, it's usually very level-headed, and it's very stern, and it's very strong, and that is something that has invited me to figure out how to better interact with my anger. And so here's why I don't agree with the second part of what James says in this passage. Well, because Jesus gets angry all the time. He's pretty Amen. unrighteous. So I want us to spend the last part of our, of our time together just focusing on some moments where Jesus gets angry and expresses anger. Because for me, if I'm going to model my life after anybody in Scripture, it's usually Jesus. So three moments when Jesus gets angry. Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Jesus encounters a man with a withered hand. The religious leaders are upset that Jesus would dare to heal this man's withered hand on the Sabbath. And Jesus pushes back against this, and he says, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save a life or to kill? But they were silent, and he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. Jesus is like, seriously? This person is encountering me today on this day, and I'm always on the go. This may be their one moment to receive healing in an area that they would like to receive healing. Who cares if it's a Sabbath? Is it harming anybody by me healing him? Don't keep this person from me. Don't keep this person from keeping, from getting the goodness of God from me. Don't forget keep this person just because it's a particular day and you're so strict with the law that you can't see the person. So Jesus is, is angry with them in this moment. Mark chapter 10, verse 14. I love this story. People bring children to Jesus and the disciples start scolding them. No, 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 get away. Jesus doesn't have time for your kids. He doesn't have time for kids. Get away. And then this is what Jesus says in verse 14. When Jesus saw this, he grew angry. And he said to them, allow the children to come to me. Don't forbid them, because God's kingdom belongs to people like this. Again, another moment where the religious elite or where his disciples are trying to keep people from him. He makes them angry. Don't keep people from me. And then Matthew 21, Mark 11, Luke 21, John 2, literally all four Gospels. If a story is in all four Gospels, turn up your ears a little bit. All right? Jesus starts flipping tables in the temple. He enters the temple and he sees the merchants profiting off of the pious pilgrims coming to buy their offerings after a long travel. Basically, they're price gouging them. And the Bible doesn't say in this passage that he was angry. But I'm pretty sure it's safe to assume that because this dude starts fashioning cords into whips. <laughs> and then he starts lashing the vendors or at least near them. We don't know what he's quite doing with these, with these whips. Then he's flipping over tables and chairs, the passage tells us. He gives them this huge speech about what they're doing is wrong, how it's not okay. Uh, some commentators would argue that the real problem here was that the market was set up in what is called the court of the Gentiles. This was the only place where people who were not Jewish were allowed to gather at the temple. And that perhaps Jesus was, was, was most angry in this moment because the one place, who were, one place where there were people who weren't Jewish that could come as close as the nearest as they could to God had been taken over by merchants and had, had been taken up by a place of thieves instead of a place where those who were not Jews could draw near to God. And so perhaps, again, Jesus is ticked in another moment because people are making it harder for them to come to him, to see and experience God, and he is angry about it. It's unacceptable. Mark chapter 11 in this story, interesting how the Pharisees respond when Jesus gets angry and flips tables and lashes and all this stuff. When the leading priests and teachers of religious law heard what Jesus had done, they began planning how to kill him. But they were afraid of him because the people were so amazed at his teaching. I want you to catch this for a moment. The religious leaders are more upset about Jesus flipping tables, freeing the animals and the chairs, than they are about people being kept from God and being manipulated and taken advantage of and hurt and harmed. Where have we heard this before? I think about 2020 and 2021 and the Black Lives Matter movement that really captured the conversation in our church about racial justice and equity. And I think about when now that started to rise up, people were so upset that anybody would ever break a window or would ever damage a store because they're so upset and angry because of how they're being treated. 
And people were so fixated, well, that's just not the way to do that. That's not the right way to do it. You can't act like that. You gotta be civil. You gotta be, and okay, we'll never do that. I don't know. I'm like, yeah, well, welcome back. And so I'm like, take a moment here. Take a moment here. And let's just stop and think about the fact that you are more concerned about things that can be replaced being broken to make a statement of anger and, 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 and protest than you are about the people who are upset and asking why are they so upset that they would do that. It's a common narrative that people become so focused on possessions that they forget people. That they, that, that they prize the breaking of possessions in the moments of anger and rage that they completely forget the people and the reason those people are angry and hurt and what led to this moment and they undermined it. And in this moment, the Pharisees are interested in doing what? Literally planning the plot to kill Jesus. Silence him. Talk about anger. Talk about rage. Y'all are upset about some tables. You're getting ready to plan to kill somebody because they flipped some tables and they made a point. You think you're more righteous for that? As we stopped this month and reflected on the life of MLK, I can't help but stop and see this common narrative of the person who rises up and speaks truth to power, even in a nonviolent way, leads to a violent death. Even when he played by the rules that the white man created, it still leads to his death. Our relationship to anger, it has to be reevaluated. We have to think about it deeply. According to the philosopher Misha Cherry, she writes in the book, The Case for Rage, Why Anger is Essential to Anti-Racism Struggle. She says, according to the philosopher Misha Cherry, anger does not deserve its bad reputation. It is powerful, but its power can be a force for good. And not only is it something we don't have to discourage, it's something we ought to cultivate actively. People fear anger because they paint it in broad strokes, but we can't dismiss all anger, especially now. There is a form of anger that is, in fact, crucial to the anti-racist struggle today. I think Jesus is experiencing the full array of emotions seen in the movie Inside Out. <laughs> I think he is. And I think if Jesus wasn't experiencing all the emotions, he, would, he could not say that he came fully as man and fully as human. He couldn't say that he understood our lived experience. He had to experience anger if he's going to say that he understands all that we struggle and we suffer with. And if you, know, you don't know the movie Inside Out, it is an animated film by Pixar that explores the emotions inside an 11-year-old girl named Riley. Joy, sadness, anger, fear, and disgust all work together to guide Riley's life challenges. When joy and sadness get lost on Riley's memories, it leads to a journey of self-discovery. The film beautifully depicts the complexity of emotions and highlights the importance of embracing all of our fear and feelings for a balanced life. One of the quotes from the movies is, we are a mix of emotions, and that's what makes us unique and beautiful. And when we decide to demonize some of the emotions that God gave us and God experienced, we lose a bit of ourselves. We lose the tool we've been given to navigate and guide us towards the light and through life. We must learn to integrate and befriend all of these in healthy, constructive ways. Each person is a canvas of emotions, weaving a rich tapestry of experience and thoughts and feelings and emotions. Dr. Daniel S. Siegel, psychologist and author, says, it is a mix of emotions that mold our perspectives and shape our relationships that fuel us towards growth. So despite some of the ancient practices of our writers of scripture and the negative take on anger, it is a fundamental part of the tapestry of our human emotion. I've now shared with you on many of occasions as a church how, how difficult it has been for me to navigate my relationship right with my father. And, and so here I am talking about it again. Um, because I think one of the biggest things, that, the gifts that I have had is to learn how to deal with in adulthood now the anger I have with my father for the ways that he hasn't been able to show up and be there for me as a, as a parent and to figure out how to harness that. And for me, the biggest part of that has been that to express to him in every moment I can the ways that I'm hurt, the ways he's let me down, the ways he's disappointed me, instead of bearing it and holding it and holding it, and then it bursts out in some really, really uncivilized and unhelpful and unproductive ways. That doesn't mean I don't still get angry with him, 
but it means when my anger comes, I'm able to harness it just a little bit better. Just a little bit. I'm still working on it. And so my invitation to us is, as a church is to figure out where are the places that we feel angry. What is the work that we can do in those places to, to befriend it, to have healthier practices with ourselves and with those who we interact with in our lives, with the New York Times, and with the tragedies and wars that are going on in the world. What can we do to channel that anger, as Jesus did, to bring about transformation and change? Uh, Riley, when all the emotions are happening in her body in the movie Inside Out, anger declares, it's time to take a stand and show Riley who's in charge. <laughs> Finally, anger is rising up and saying, we're going to take our place. And I just sort of picture that happening in Jesus as his ministry goes on. <laughs> that there's these moments when anger rises up and it's like, we're going to take charge. We're going to take care of this. We're going to not allow this oppression and, and this exclusion of people. And then yet somehow in the midst of that, when they come to arrest him and Peter rises up, and cuts off the ear of the soldier, Jesus is able to harness his love and his anger in such a way that instead he heals the ear of the man and realizes anger in this moment isn't going to repair anything. Only love will. And so to be able to be discerning in our hearts enough to know when is the moment for anger, when is the moment for grace and love, is the great balance and challenge that Jesus embodied and calls us to embody as we balance the tapestry of complex emotions that exist inside of us. Amen? Amen. Amen. It's 1210. <laughs> and I want to invite those in the church who are part of the queer community to be a part of an opportunity that we're giving you to help you harness those difficult emotions. We have we got a grant that is going to allow us to work with a um, trained counselor um, who will be doing a weekend workshop March 15th and 16th with those who are in church who are queer. Um, and queer could be, if you've ever had a queer thought, you're there. You're welcome, okay? Um, let's make it super broad, super wide. Um, and you get to define what queer thoughts it thought is, so you just be creative with it. If you need to be here, be there, you be there. Um, and this is a space for those of us who are just navigating difficult family dynamics and relationships, who are navigating um, difficult emotions with our, within ourselves and need help figuring out healthy coping mechanisms, healthy boundaries, healthy communication, healthy, healthy um, mechanisms to, to deal with our emotions. Uh, we hope that you'll come. It's it's uh, covered by the grant, but we are asking just for ten dollars to help cover food for that weekend. Um, so we hope that you register. There's only twenty five spots. So I hope you'll make that a priority and be a part of that. You can sign up at forefrontnyc.com/events. That's my shameless plug for that. So now um, I want to ask us for a moment uh, to sit with some questions. This is an excellent book. It's called Black Liturgies, and I've been devouring it. It's so excellent to just sit with. And I'm trying not to go too fast through it so that I actually like sit with it. Um, but I encourage you, there's a, there's a chapter in here about rage, if you do pick this up. This book is by Cole Arthur Riley. And they're, they're, the chapter on rage and anger was has been super helpful and insightful for me, and I hope it will be for you too. And there are five questions, six questions, that are asked at the end of the chapter that I'm going to invite us as the piano plays to just enter into a, a mode of contemplation. But before we do that, if you have a phone, unlike me, because um, it's sitting right there. Take your phone out and I invite you to take a picture of these questions that are going to be on the screen. They're not there. I'm going to post them this week on our social media and, and I'll put them in the newsletter this next week um, since then we don't have a slide. Or um, you can always go back and listen to the live stream. I'm going to read them to you right now. And I want you to sit with them and use them as a navigation tool as you work through a healthy relationship with anger. So whatever posture you need to take, hear these questions. What was your family of origin's relationship to anger? How did it manifest in? In what ways? Who did it manifest in and in what ways? What is your relationship to anger in this season? In what ways are you or aren't you prone to suppression? I invite you to explore different instinctive feelings about individual rage versus collective rage. Does either feel more appropriate or inappropriate to you? What do you think that that is about? Where have you seen rage or anger practiced well? What made it a healthy demonstration of anger? Which emotions do you disguise your anger with? How did you learn to do this? Number six, travel into a memory when someone demonized your anger. A 
imagine what you would say or do today. Sit with that last one for just a moment. Back to the meeting we question, perhaps even. Travel into a memory when someone demonizes your anger. Imagine what you would do or say today.